Welcome to Uncomfortable, conversations about culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I'm joined by Jess. Hello, world. And Alex. Bees will buzz, kids will blow dandelion fuzz, and I'll be doing whatever snow does in summer. Happy summer, everybody. It's here, <laughs> officially, as lo- I mean, for kids, at least. School's Let me guess, out. today's the first day of summer. summer. Is that what's going on? <laughs> school is, well, it depends on what school your children go to. Well, it's actually on a calendar, like, season thing. Yeah, it's not. It's not just based on day. the school. I know. Yeah. This is, that was Alex's but declaration, summer break couldn't is, you tell? Oh, okay, you're summer just saying summer break. Summer begin until June. Mm-hmm. But summer break is here, so a lot of people, you know, Memorial Day this weekend, so that's when... I'm a, I'm a proponent of summer is basically Memorial Day to Labor Day. That's kind of... So not necessarily just school calendar. Oh, okay. Okay. So You're it's a Memorial calendar. Day thing yeah. for you. That's also white pants, you know, when you can and can't wear white pants. It's after Memorial Day, you can wear yep. white Until pants. Until before Labor Day. First day of summer is June 20th. Yeah. So you're a little, a little ahead there, but... Anyways, well, you know, this is the podcast for you if you're ever looking for a day of the <laughs> month. Uh, Alex is our resident day professional. Of the month today. Uh, yeah, but dad, you, you it's our dad jokes or mm. something. Yeah, yeah, day. Of, yeah. Anyways, well, thanks, Alex. Appreciate that. He never lets us down. Uh, uh-uh, uh no. Except for I feel like you're leading bit. people astray a little bit with this. I mean, summer, summer break. I guess. What do you, what do you do you look forward to summer break or is it like oh it's more stressful because my kids aren't away for you know a designated amount of hours a day. Yeah, I look forward to summer break. I'm just I don't know anybody who doesn't say like in June that it's like people. I don't know anybody that's like, it's June 20th. Yeah. Finally, I'm going to declare it's summer, like yeah. in actual like rhythms of life. That's true. That's very true. So that's just my argument for that's it. A good, that's a good argument. And so it, is, it is fun to have more flexibility, you know, yeah. with kids. I take a little more PTO uh, throughout the summer than normal and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Well... Uh, I will say something. Yeah, say something. My yes. therapist and I talked about this yesterday, mm-hmm. and she said that that summer comes in four waves. So I wrote these down. Oh, interesting. First, you feel overwhelmed mm, okay. because what are you going to do all summer? Mm. And then you move into delight. So I love summer. Summer's the best. Check things off the bucket list. And then sadness, like time is a thief. It's going so fast. Hmm. And then relief when maybe school or change of routine comes around again, because you can get into routine, acknowledge that you're going back to school. And so there's like the four stages and I'm definitely in the stage one of overwhelm. Like, what are we doing? It's four stages of summer Kids are out break. of school. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Well, we'll all figure it out. We'll, we'll be okay. We'll be, we're fine. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be okay. You and know, we have Alex to rely on. Yeah. And Alex, um, we're going to rely on you right now for a voicemail. Maybe I, it's from someone called Summer. Name Summer, we'll see. I I mean, I'm going to highly doubt that, but let's find out. (laughs) Hey guys, Keegan here. Uh, Just wondering if you guys are learning anything new currently, or uh, what are you planning on learning new in the future? Thanks. Uh, Looking forward to hearing your answers. Oh, I've got an answer to this one. I do. You're so excited. That's a very simple and complicated it's good for summer. Series probably, listening to me. Well. Sorry. Like for uh, summer. Insightful question. It's a good time to learn something new. No, I thanks to you, Alex. You introduced me to this uh, ASL app. So I'm currently on a streak there learning some ASL. So that's been that's been fun. For those who don't know, that's American Sign Language. Yeah. Ling Vano is the name of the app. There, I'm endorsing it. We're not sponsored. Mm-hmm. But have What's you it gone called? to the lesson where it teaches you how to sign Ling Vongo? No, I haven't. Right. I'm on. Uh, I'm, I just finished chapter three, so I'm, okay. it is know. a great ASL. I'm also learning that. Um, does that count? Can I count that as my answer too? Since you yeah. answered first. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just got excited because I've been having fun learning that. How far are you though? I need to know what chapter you're on so I can try to catch up. <laughs> um, I am on a different chat. Jess, you want to? You want to tell us what you're excited about while I try to find what chapter what I'm on? What I'm excited about? Or, or I what, think, you're what am I learning? What you're learning. learning. That's, the, that's the question. <laughs> Eric was excited about what he's learning. Uh, my I, um, I, I feel like Shh. I'm... What are you? I'm he's, on chapter 28. He's chapter, way chapter up 20. there. I didn't even know what that 127-day streak right now, so Jeez. that's exciting. 
I feel like I'm like in a in a phase of like learning like how to accept where I'm at. Like mm-hmm. I just feel like I have like a lot of deep stuff going on. I'm like on the brink of a new decade. Mm-hmm. Turning forty in a couple weeks, which is oh, so weird. Wow. I don't feel <coughs> forty. Welcome None of my club. teen clients guess I'm for would be forty. So that always makes keeps me feeling young. But yeah. there's something about changing into a new decade, and so I'm like, okay, what do I want? Like, I think that that's just a, a timely question. What do I want to learn? Mm-hmm. So what do you, so is that basically it? I feel like I'm trying to learn, like you know, what like from my mistakes. I think like accepting like where we're at, I feel like our, like 40 is at like half my life, like in ideally. And so just, I don't know, learning to accept that is Mm. like not in a negative way, but that's something. And then it just sounds kind of dumb to now say, I also am trying to learn how to do like lettering better. Like your, (laughs) like draw like handwriting. Yeah. But like, like a calligraphy calligraphy or like something like that. So So your signature will be very fancy. Maybe Mm. that will be nice. Maybe we'll let you sign or redraw the uncomfortable. Well, I feel I feel like you guys kind of you kind of gatekeeped the ASL thing because I I want to learn too. Oh, so well, I feel is, like I'm sorry. I need you to, t- to show yeah, me that. Yeah, Alex really that gate, app later, so. gatekeep that. That's true. I, I mean, you tell me every <laughs> holiday coming up. Yeah, <laughs> but the things I want to know. Well, it's so I sent out something to our staff, oh. those who would like to learn ASL. He forgot you you would and switch. Um, forgot, just He forgot me. You weren't on the mail list. So list many of us, it was just all staff, and if your name wasn't on there, it didn't send it to you. And many of the staff decided they wanted to learn it, which is exciting because we have a, um, if you didn't know, a new minister on staff who's deaf, and um, so it's fun to be able to communicate with her. So, yeah. Awesome. All righty. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, caller, for that fun question. Uh, we are going to be talking about a football player today, mm-hmm. but not maybe for the not reasons the that you think. Uh, no, this guy, you know, he wears red as well. He's a, a Kansas City chief, the kicker, Harrison Butker. Uh, he had a speech recently, uh, a graduation speech. And he said some things that have, you know, got people talking and we thought we'd break some of that down today. So stay tuned for that. Full disclosure, I I didn't know who Harrison Butker was before the speech started circulating. Uh, I mean, there's only one or there's two Kansas City Chiefs that I know, uh, Patrick Mahomes and of course, Taylor's boyfriend. Um <laughs> So I saw this going around and and some of the things he was saying and people were finding controversy in it. I kind of shrugged off initially because I'm like, "Ah, okay, I mean, he's voicing his opinion. That's fine. Whatever. Who cares? And then now I now I understand why there's a weight behind it. Um, But yeah, it, it was a commencement speech for Benedictine College. And uh, he said he. He said a lot in this 20 minute speech. So I, I, I suppose if people want to get their own per- perception or context around it, they can they can listen to the whole thing. But Alex, you have a short clip that kind of start us off here if we want to play that. These are the sorts of things we are told in polite society to not bring up. You know, the difficult and unpleasant things. But if we are going to be men and women for this time in history, we need to stop pretending that the Church of Nice is a winning proposition. We must all. There you go. The I church, the going, church. But. Yeah, we could just, we'll just yeah. listen to that. The Church of Nice is a winning proposition, huh? Um. Yeah. So what? In even selecting that that snippet of his speech, can you give us give us some context to what you? Th- either what you know he he's referring to or what you think he's maybe. Yeah. And I, I definitely would encourage people to listen to the <clears throat> full, you know, commencement address that he gave to get, weigh in like a full opinion on mm-hmm. it. Cause I hadn't, I mean, I had seen it going around the internet and, um, you know, things like what we just did highlighted on there. And there'll be some more that we talk about that. We'll just kind of read some of the quotes. 
um, without kind of fully, I don't, I didn't know what Benedictine college was. I didn't know a lot of those types of things. And so, um, understanding, yeah. So Harrison Butker kicker for Kansas city chiefs, obviously they won, won some super bowls recently. And, uh, he gave a commencement speech and he even talks about this in, in during this speech last year at Georgia tech where, which was his alma mater, but he is a devoutly Catholic, um, you know, person. And he talks about that a lot throughout the speech and Benedictine college is a, um, Benedictine university, which was basically combined, uh, in, in, I think in the 1960s between an all men's college, uh, and then an all women's Catholic college. And, and they combined and their, uh, public liberal arts college in Kansas, small little school. And so he was given a speech to people and I, I would call this maybe like an, an address to like a, a certain crowd of people, mm-hmm. obviously, like a small crowd, a, a Catholic college. So this wasn't like Super Bowl mm-hmm. parade celebration speech, but it was like designed and they asked him to come in and, and give this speech. And he's been known, I think, for being somewhat controversial or maybe it, it depends on who you are, but speaking about his religion and his faith and his beliefs and his values a lot. And he'll sprinkle in, uh, some of his political beliefs in there. So he did all of these things inside of the speech and was encouraging, especially these Catholic, uh, graduates, you know, to being the quote unquote church of nice, uh, passive, whatever you want to call it is not a winning proposition for culture. And so he kind of sets it up and then he gets into some more and more details about what he means, I think throughout the speech that we'll talk about. So, Break down the term Church of Nice for us. What do you, I mean, I have my own idea what I think he means by that, but I'd be curious, like, is he just, is he labeling the Catholic church in general, all churches? Is he saying that we're more concerned with our reputation than we are teaching the gospel with, you know? I think, yeah, it seems like that, especially he seems to be talking predominantly about the Roman Catholic church. And he's very much through his conversations in this speaking. And we had an entire conversation, uh, probably a couple months ago with, Mm -hmm. um, father Damien and Jim Jansen from the Omaha archdiocese, where we talked about a lot of the commonality, um, between what is quote unquote, the Protestant church and the Catholic church and how we have ecumenical conversations. That was a really good conversation. I think Harrison may, might not even agree with us having that conversation uh, yeah. based on how he's giving this speech. Cause he's very much into the Roman Catholic church is that is the Christian church and there's nothing else um, that's sanctioned by God uh, mm-hmm. to be, you know, the, the church that, that Jesus is working through. And so you get some of those vibes I would say from this. And I think he's ma- mostly addressing that he talks about pastors and priests in, in this and calls them out in a lot of ways, especially around the pandemic, how some of them were closing their doors and letting the Eucharist, which is a really mm-hmm. big deal in Roman Catholicism, like <laughs> to be a faithful Catholic, you take the Eucharist, which is what we would call communion mm-hmm. uh, every single week. And if you don't do that, you need to go to confession. And, and so he was, you know, calling out some churches for, giving into the pressure from government to shut their doors and not giving out the Eucharist and people were dying without the Eucharist, which if, if you believe that deeply about the Eucharist and, Mm -hmm. and, and that it's a salvation issue, uh, I can see how he's very passionate about, you know, those types of things. So it seems Mm -hmm. like the church of nice is just a passive church. And this is my interpretation. I'd love to hear you guys is a passive Catholic church that's not speaking up with authority to the government, to, you know, politics, Mm. to the media. He calls out some media inside of that and says they won't like this speech. And so, uh, and he's certainly right. They have not liked the speech, but that, that, that's my reaction to what I think he's talking about. That makes sense to me. I, Mm -hmm. uh, he just goes all over the place in in this speech. He he covers so many subjects, so many and, topics, and and, and there, <clears throat> and and it's interesting to me because I feel like 
Yeah, sure. You're gonna. It's gonna land on your ears differently. Like some people are gonna go, yeah, that's good. Some people are gonna have problems with it. I mean, at one point he references Martin Scorsese's movie Silence and yeah. completely misses the point of that movie and tries to say it's like saying something like it's Hollywood telling Christians to be quiet or Catholics to be quiet about their faith, which is not the point of that movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've seen it, it's actually a very powerful movie about missionaries in Japan and the sacrifices they made to spread the gospel. And I mean, it, it does maybe the ending that I could see how someone would interpret it, but it's just interesting. Cause there's, I feel like there's a lot of moments there where he's talking about, um, I think he brings up, uh, um, a new legislation passed about Christians not being able to say that the Jews killed Jesus without going to jail. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's like, there's there's truth behind that, but it's like it's it's exaggerated, you know, the way he's he's representing it. Um, so, and I would say this is probably one of the things where a lot of times in media we can see a clip of something and say, yeah. "Oh, I got the gist of that." This mm-hmm. is certainly one where it's gone so viral, and I've it's and there's been so many um, back and forth about this mm-hmm. that it's it is really one that either watch it or read through it to get the some of the context of this truly yeah. because it goes from covid to abortion to different priests and bishops and it's just all over the place and so for uh, for you to really have a good grasp on it I feel like it was worth the time and Alex thankfully sent me the transcript because it was easier to read it cuz I got mm. it was hard to keep up listening to it <clears throat> well and it, I I think it like even further speaks to this cultural desire to where people seem to just think nobody's telling it like it is anymore. Mm -hmm. And you, you get this sentiment in different groups and it's not just one, you know, one religion or one political party. It's this discontentment across the board where people feel that nobody, everybody's skirting the truth. No, nobody's really being tr- honest and we're all, we're too concerned about people's feelings and, and whatnot. Um, and if I hadn't gone and read the whole thing, I would have thought that this, this, this was a speech about women mm-hmm. and women that, that women should be homemakers and following <clears throat> one that vocation. Is, and so that is the clip. There's that so much more yeah. gotten the that's most the attention. Gone. Uh, so why don't we talk about that a little bit? Um, I mean, he, he isn't hesitant to bring it up. I think one of the things he says, this is a, I'm going to, I guess it's a quote from it. It says for the ladies present today, congratulations on an amazing accomplishment. I want to speak directly to you briefly because I think it is you, the women who have had the most diabolical lies told to you, who many of you are sitting here now about to cross the stage and thinking about, all the promotions and titles you are going to get in your career. And he says that, but then he goes on to pretty much kind of downplay that and say your true calling. I mean, what you're actually dreaming about is being a homemaker and having children and Mm -hmm. getting getting married and having children. Which I feel like as a woman that kind of like seeing that, that kind of rubbed me the wrong way because Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, just seeing a man telling me what I think, like it, that makes me feel defensive, like initially, because I'm like, oh, you mm-hmm. know, and I didn't know the context of who he was talking to, because if you watch the mm-hmm. that exact clip right after he says that he gets a long mm-hmm. applause, like, I mean, mm-hmm. people loved it because he was speaking to a specific group that mm-hmm. that was probably pretty passionate for them. Um and he, he calls out his wife and that as she yeah. is a homemaker and, you know, he gets pretty emotional there. So you see that, but it's also someone who's like prescribing a, a certain type of lifestyle mm-hmm. based on his own lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And that that's what everyone should have. Yeah. And I think he, de- he certainly is, like you said, getting emotional, Eric, about mm-hmm. it. Speaking from his own life's circumstances and undoubtedly I've had moments I've probably even done on the podcast where I've, you know, spoken from my 
personal point of view, which I'm grateful for my wife and, you know, the things that she does to make our family, you know, go and the sacrifices she makes so that Mm -hmm. I can experience a lot of things I do. I mean, undoubtedly she sacrifices a lot. And, and I think at large, there's a lot of men that do not publicly praise or, or give their wives the credit for all the things that they do, whether Mm -hmm. they work or not. And we talked about a lot of those conversations, maybe the stigmas or what maybe stay at home moms feel versus working moms. Jess, you, you led an entire conversation about that, which makes me think like a lot of the things he talked about, we've addressed on the podcast, which is for sure for me, encouraging because these are real things that are trigger points for a lot of people inside of, society. Uh, but I think some of the, maybe the misses for, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think him talking about his wife and giving her praise and all those kind of things is at all inappropriate, but I think the misses are, you know, the words like, I think he said something along the lines, like her life really began in that moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I don't think him calling her, being a homemaker, a vocation even. And I know people, there's people that have gotten upset about that mm-hmm. is a bad thing, but no. I think it's, and, and maybe we'll all find the, the direct quote cause I don't want to misrepresent him, but I think he said something along the lines of, um, that that's when she came alive in, mm-hmm. inside of her life. Uh, and so, which that doesn't mean, doesn't mean it's not true for her. Yeah. You know, like she would be the first to say her life truly started when she began living her vocation as a wife and as a mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it, this goes back to that. I, I don't know. It's, it, it feels like a conversation we have over and over again, but it is, it is that, that empathy thing of, yeah, that, that can be true for one person and not true for, her, for yeah, another totally. person. It could be totally right? true for her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But from the, you know, the platform or the, the stage where you're kind of, you're giving the charge in some ways for, Hey, you, you just accomplished something. A lot of these women had just spent, you know, thousands upon, th- especially thinking of a private college, mm-hmm. countless amount of money to, you know, work towards a career. Some of them maybe in ministry. Um, I think knowing that about your audience is, especially in that moment, because undoubtedly there are a lot of women who have gone into the workforce, who have education, who have got a lot of those things that decide, Hey, I'm going to end up being a homemaker or be a homemaker for this season of my life or stay at home mom for this season of my life. Mm -hmm. And they are sacrificing in a big way. A lot of the, the money, the time, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of those things. And that's not bad, but he's almost, it feels encouraging that, or maybe this isn't yeah. the place to have that <laughs> right away. This isn't the place to have that conversation. Like, yeah. Hey, congrats. You just spent all this time working towards this, but it, I could see how someone would say, but this doesn't, but that wasn't good enough. Yeah. You know, congrats, but you, you wasted some of your time. And right. then I had to look up because the word vocation was used so much that I had to look up the definition. It's a strong feeling of suitability for a particular career or occupation. Mm. And so to me, it was used so much that I'm like, okay, to help me give him some empathy, I need to understand what that meant. And so to me, it's like, okay, where almost like a calling, like where are you called? Like what's suitable for you at this time? Because I've talked to many people and I have uh, one of my best friends does not feel called to get married or have kids. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very, like was a very offensive thing to interact with of like, well, is my life less significant or less important because I am not doing that and because I don't want to do that. Well, and it, it's, it feels like a callback to some of our other conversations about relationships yeah. and how there's this notion sometimes and when, it, when it's tied to faith or the church that your spouse is what completes you. Hmm. Uh, and that's what makes you holy is this this entering into a relationship and beginning a family. And so when you have that preconceived idea, then that's the only thing that's the ultimate goal for everyone. And so, yeah, it's, it just feels, it feels a little backwards. It feels rudimentary in some ways, but I also can't help but feel like 
it is just more more of a reaction to like he even s- says several times that you know he's an amateur public speaker and this is kind of a new thing for him but people keep asking him to do it and i i can't help but think that some of it's the controversy behind it that it draws you know and and there's just we've just seen this over and over again i just want somebody to just tell it like it is mm-hmm. and and to what end like what what are you accomplishing by you're not you're not leaving room for anybody you're not leaving oxygen in the room mm-hmm. for anybody else you're not you're not telling it like it is you're telling it like you believe like you're giving your perspective on something and your opinion on something which is fine you can share your opinion but to make it prescriptive to everybody Completely. that isn't that isn't changing anybody's mind I mean, those people in the room may agree with him, and so they're going to cheer and applaud. And so, you're, yeah, you're rallying the troops, but you're not you're not swaying anybody who thinks differently than you. So, this idea of telling it like it is does no good. It doesn't. It's not. I don't. I don't know. To me, I, I think like in a church setting, you look to the Holy Spirit to convict. So, as as a minister or pastor gets on the stage, delivers a message they can speak biblical truth and then they have to rely on the Holy spirit to do his work to convict someone. And then Mm. that through that work, they can make a change in their life. The idea of just telling it like it is, if it's not like fully founded in scripture, I don't know. I just don't know that that's, I don't know. It's interesting because a lot of these arguments are kind of loosely based in scripture. They're not completely founded there. And he yeah. uses the words stay in your own lane quite a bit, which yeah. to me seems a bit, a bit ironic. And I'm not, I don't know what his education <laughs> background is. Coming from I, a kicker. Yeah. And, and, and right. even to that point, he's, he's a talented athlete and, and hopefully he'll have uh, his career in the NFL won't, isn't his identity, you know, either at the same time. And sure. I think he's trying to, to point out, out to that, but it seems like this idea, you know, to stay in your own lane and he's like calling out even priests and all those kind of things, which I think is is needed. I think we've talked about this inside of even you he know has a degree in industrial engineering is what he says in the speech. In, okay, industrial engineering. Yeah. So he's calling out a lot of leaders inside of, uh, of the Catholic Church, and you know even points towards you know the idea of um, of Latin Mass kind of being and. and which in the Catholic church, there's some, some pretty good feelings or, or difficult feelings about even when all masses, you know, used to be in Latin in the Catholic church, even up until recently. So most of the history of the Catholic church, even if you were English speaking, a lot of the, the mass would be in Latin. And so he's even drawing like a, Mm -hmm. a paradigm, a paradox between those who are kind of going to the JV Mm -hmm. English speaking mass and those who are really, you know, hearing, from the word of God. And he says, Jesus was very serious and the Bible is very serious about following the right order of things. And so you need to embrace these traditional kinds of things. But I think that idea of staying in your own lane and I'm not anti, cause I think that leaders in the churches should be called out. Uh, I think, mm-hmm. and he does there, there have been abuses in the church. There's things in church leadership that we cannot just let go on without people calling it to yeah. their attention and all those things. And, and so that side of it, I, I think is, is interesting, but the paradox of him telling people to stay in their own lane or maybe the ways in which to go about this, he's, he's more saying, Hey, don't go about it in the passive ways of going and talking to your pastor or going to talk to your priest. Uh, he's saying you need to go and talk out loud about it to kind of create more awareness and call these people out, call them to the carpet publicly. And Mm -hmm. so I think that's one of the things he's really focusing on here as well. And I don't fully understand all the nuances of, of the Catholic church. And that's all basically from my own understanding and family history and things like that. So I could, I could be getting something in there wrong, Mm -hmm. even about, you know, the Latin um, Mm -hmm. stuff they talks about, but I think that's all just one of those interesting things that he mentions in there. And, staying in your lane, but it, it seems like he is not very passionate about staying in his own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I thought what an uncomfortable conversation. It made me think about our podcast because yeah. uncomfortable conversations about 
culture, culture and Christianity. Christianity. And so here's somebody that's bringing in all these cultural issues mm -hmm. in 20 minutes, yeah, di like intersecting it with faith mm -hmm. and kind of like dropping a couple bombs. And so a lot of times that happens in our culture. We, we see that this, this I feel was like a little Petri dish of a lot of things, mm -hmm. but then it also shows like there's an, another space for us to intersect with that and say, where, where is my relationship with God leading me? Where have my experiences and my education and how God has worked in my life? Like, how does that intersect yeah. with these things? And so I think it creates a lot of uncomfortability, but also like, you know, a lot of conversations to come out or even like to clarify, Hey, like, what do I think about this? Like this, what do I think about vocations and like careers and women and mm -hmm. all these different things? And there are people that have put out statements on this. Obviously the NFL um, people have gotten upset or there's people that have probably read it out of context or don't understand. Maybe they're not a part of the Catholic faith or didn't totally understand. Okay. He's talking to a, a segmented audience of people that, would claim that they believe a lot of the same things that he believes. And so there's people, anytime people get upset. And so the NFL has put out statements. Uh, Roger Goodell, who's the commissioner said, we have over 3000 players. We have executives around the league that have a diversity of opinions and thoughts, just like America does. I think it's something we treasure and that's part of it. I think ultimately that's what makes us a society better. Um, and he said he doesn't have anything else to add to the NFL's statement last week that says these are the views that are not those of the NFL as an organization. And, and obviously we see you'll find something like that on the end of our podcast, too. You know, mm -hmm. our views or conversations that we're having don't necessarily represent Christ Community Church as as the full entity. So so there was that part. But then there's the reactionary part of I think last week he surpassed the people that you even know, Eric, uh, for Jersey sales. And so there's this Did base really? of people wow. that uh, all <laughs> wanted the kicker Jersey. And because people wanted to support him and people were excited oh. about his boldness and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, I, I think you're talking about Mahomes and Taylor's girlfriend. Mahomes I mean, and boyfriend. Taylor's boyfriend. Yes, Sorry, boyfriend. clarification. So he out he outsold all of those last week and became, I think, the the most popular NFL for for that week. We'll see how long that lasts. Maybe there will be an entire day where everyone at the game, the Chiefs game, wears the Butker jersey. Who knows? It, yeah, I I I mean, I know we're talking about his speech and what it what he said, but there's just a part of me that just can't separate it from like what what our society is becoming and like what like even hearing that that happens so many times when somebody says something that a people group agree with the way that they show the support they become they come become like a poster child or whatever you want to call it um i don't know I, d I don't, I just really, I don't understand what people's goals are in that and what they're, I mean, I know. Is it to I'll, like send a message? I, I, all I can assume is that they f there's just such a large population of people that feel unheard or that, that their opinions don't matter and that people are telling them that all of America thinks this way and they're being kind of silenced. And I think, I mean, I think they're, that's probably true because you, you, you have like extremes of, Washington DC or Hollywood uh, or you know New York and the stock market and, and people that are people that are outspoken on, on these platforms on the outer edges of the country and then kind of middle America is a lot of times not represented in media very well mm -hmm. and when they are represented in media it's kind of as an extremist thing and so when someone comes out and and maybe speaks to their values in a way that is encouraging and affirming then you see them okay i'm gonna buy jerseys to support it and it i don't know it's, it seems like it's not super equal like to me hearing mm -hmm. a conversation like that is i don't want to say a hundred to one maybe though yeah. of just like how much mm -hmm. it's unbalanced in the conversations mm -hmm. well and I, I was trying to find his name right now i read it in another article but essentially 
this speech that was given last year by a non-famous, you know, mm-hmm. non-NFL person was very similar <laughs> to this. Okay, and to so this. he talked a lot about, um, about, you know, traditional Catholic values mm-hmm. and, you know, the, the role of homemaker and some of those things inside of his speech. And so he was even tweeting a little bit about how this wasn't very different. Like that, if you've gone to a few of these at this college, this is kind of what you expect. And, mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that was interesting, especially given, you know, we recently had Don Gentry teach here at Christ Community Church. And uh, as a woman teaching, that's very controversial in a lot of different places Mm -hmm. inside of the Christian church. And uh, so there's a lot of people that have gotten onto a clip where she's talking in uh, about first Corinthians 14. And and when Paul uh, is saying a woman should be silent and it's, it is the post that we have, seen more comments on than probably any other post. And most of the people that are getting angry are getting angry because they don't believe that they see Mm -hmm. it. They Mm -hmm. think that a woman shouldn't be giving a talk. They're thinking that this church is woke and all the other things they're saying, they're being very misogynistic and not everybody, but a lot of people and their approach to how they're commenting on it because they're passionate about it. But in our context, like Mm -hmm. at Christ community Mm -hmm. church, that no one's saying that, you know, Mm -hmm. this is all a bunch of people that are, that don't understand this context, don't understand. And they're seeing just a little snippet of it. Don't understand the work that's gone into it. Don't understand really all the debate. And most of them don't even understand. She's talking about first Corinthians 14 and they just bring in Titus into this entire conversation and Timothy. And so, um, it's just one of those interesting things where not understanding the, it's kind of like, well, that's Great par example. for the course. Yeah. That's par for the course at like a, a graduation commencement like this. And his at Georgia Tech last year was much different because mm-hmm. he did cater to a, a fully different audience mm-hmm. uh, inside of that. And so, so in a lot of ways, it's just no, it's no different than when a famous celebrity says they're Christian. Yeah, I, and then in the in any aspect, you know, Justin Bieber, Kanye West, these conversations we've had over and over again, and then the culture reacts yeah and it's like yes we have our spokesperson yeah we need to support them because nobody was reacting to the guy mm-hmm. that spoke but, last yeah, year that's kind of my know? point to what you're saying yeah but because of him and having a platform which it scripture does tell us that it that we are as leaders especially christian leaders held to a higher regard we do know that there's people that are watching and listening and and we we do need to take into account those types of things with, you know, influence comes great responsibility. And so there's that side of things that I think he has to, he has to uh, steward wisely as well inside of this as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. It's fascinating. It just, uh, it, it, it's this fuel for culture war that we have become, so familiar with anymore it's just it's always something new and we've just lost the ability to have any kind of nuanced conversations about anything you have to be all or nothing Mm -hmm. and like we could like if at any point in this if we've agreed or disagreed with the statements of mr butker someone listening could potentially put yeah. us in a category right you know like or oh. take a sound bite from what we've oh, yeah. said right right and take it out of context right. another thing he talks about to, to men so he kind of addressed specifically women and we read that quote but specifically to men he talks about um i'll just read it he says as a man who gets a lot of praise and has been given a platform to speak to audiences like this one today i pray that i always get to use my voice for god and not for myself to the gentlemen here today part of what plagues our society is the lie that has been told you that men are not necessary in the home or in our communities and so he talks about this idea of maybe what's thrown out there as cultural emasculation like that men at large in the society being told that, Hey, they, they're not needed in the home. And, you know, to that, I would in the right group of men, like be an encourager to, Hey, you are needed. Like fatherhood is, is critical. You can look at a lot of research and a lot of studies on the importance of a father inside of a home mm-hmm. in just shaping the hearts and the lives of their of their kids. And you look at, I mean, I do think fatherlessness 
is, you know, one of the greatest epidemics, not epidemics. That'd be a skin thing. Isn't that, isn't that an epidemic? Is that a skin disease? Yeah. What? No. Or just a, de- okay. I, no, you're good. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. Okay. You one of the biggest it. epidemics. Sorry. Yeah. I, all no, of a no. sudden I'm like, yeah. Epidermis. Okay. That's the word. That's anyway, you're thinking, I do yeah. think fatherlessness huh. has been one of the greatest epidemics inside of, yeah. especially a lot of marginalized cultures mm-hmm. um, where, um, and there's so much that goes into it. There's a poverty cycle. There's their fathers modeling that there's prison time. There, there's more than we can get into today, but undoubtedly, I think we as a culture have seen the results of you know, you, I think you have a better shot at education at being well-rounded. If you have a father, that's not to say at all that right. you have got no chance no, <laughs> that I, if you're right. raised by a single mom, that there's no chance for you or anything like that. But it's yeah. definitely one of those things that it will, it will, it's helpful. It's, it's from God's word, you know, the family and a mother and a father, uh, was God's idea for helping shape the hearts and the lives of of our kids. And mm-hmm. so definitely one of those things that, you know, in a society, especially talking to an audience like this, I think is, is a commendable thing to be having that conversation about. Can I ask you guys a question? No. Just as a, like, as a woman, just, like, just please, me. like, be a little vulnerable here. What do you two as men, as dads, as husbands do you feel the messages from culture today about who you are and what your role is like without just like in your hearts, like what do you perceive? Like how does that translate? Not necessarily what you do, but like what does culture say that your role is or who you are, or who you should be? Cause I feel like, you know, there's women could say have an answer, but I think that, I'm just curious. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's so convoluted and a crowded conversation about, oh, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk probably 10 years ago about how sitcoms and movies always make dads look dumb and, you know, irrelevant and that sort of thing, which, yeah, that gets a little, that trope gets a little tiring. But I, I'm not, I don't know, I struggle because with this, especially with this quote that he says, um, society are the, the pl- uh, plagues our society. One thing that plagues our society is that this lie that has been told that men are not necessary in the home. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Like, I don't know that that message is being conveyed. I'm not even sure what he's getting at there. I don't know who's mm-hmm. saying, I, th- I feel like in the last probably even three or four years, I've heard more and more people talking about the importance of, you know, men in the, in the home and w- w- when it's possible and when it, I don't know. It's tough. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I guess I don't feel that I am like some, I'm being told I'm not needed, but I also, I have been married for nearly 24 years in a relationship that's been, you know, we've, it's not traditional, you know, so it's just like that I probably am not needed in, in the way that maybe in a, in a tradition, tra- traditional marriage would work. But I also think there's just so many stereotypes about mm-hmm. tough dads and, oh, you got to be, you got to teach your son to be this way. And, you know, and I, and I, I've got family members who raise their kids to be much more gruff and tough. And we just say it like it is. And we do this and we're manly men and we're no, no, we treat women this way and we think this way and we do this. And, and it's like that, that's not how I'm going to raise my kids. I don't, I don't think that's what masculinity is. Masculinity is the ability to be strong under pressure and not break under pressure and be there for your family under pressure. And masculinity is being there to like hold your kids when they're struggling and, and comfort them and be caring and have a tender, touch but it's also being strong in that moment when you're surrounded by catastrophe and you're surrounded by chaos and you can be the pillar of that family when things are going crazy not to be some boisterous machismo jerk and that isn't manliness Mm -hmm. like it just isn't i don't i don't you know so that idea of that cultural masculinity being go away good Good riddance. I don't think that's what masculinity is. I don't, I, that's what frustrates me about some of these narratives that get written. It's just not the way it is. Yeah. And I, I can't say in my own life that I feel a lot of 
weird pressures to, you know, be the breadwinner or whatever. I don't know, whatever yeah. those things are out in society, because the, most I, of where I, I, I guess what I, where I was coming from, I just want to clarify. I'm sorry to cut no, you you're off. Good. I just want to clarify. It's like, I think, uh, yeah, I'm not trying to say that, oh, well, my wife works, so it's different no, or whatever. Yeah. I think it's just, I spent the, th- I've just, it's like underhanded comp- con- comments about, oh, you, you cook meals? Like yeah. you cook, like, yeah, I cook all the meals yeah. in my household. Is that a problem? Yeah. Oh, well, that sounds like a woman's job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's comments like that where yeah. it's like, no, we're, we're sharing the load. That's something I actually enjoy and I'm, I'm good at it. So I'm going to do that. It's not, it's those gender roles that shouldn't be gender roles. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the sort of yeah, thing I was getting really at. I guess. Sorry. You know, I was just thinking for the, me, like cultural emasculation, the culture that I live in and I choose to be a part of is the friends that I have and yeah. like the church environment that I'm a part of. And so in that, I don't feel like these pressures and I, I probably have to admit that I live in a bubble, mm-hmm. but like I work in a bubble in a lot of ways where I just, <laughs> because of the job that I get to, mm-hmm. to have and because, you know, I'm supported by people's gifts and that's how this church functions. Yet there's a, there is a value on me caring about my family that I don't have the pressures that some of my friends have sometimes where they have to decide, no, I can't go to this thing Mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. Like I, I I know that there's a lot of friends that I have maybe that are in other areas of work where they, they have to choose sometimes between career Mm -hmm. and family. And oftentimes, you know, they choose career because choosing career feels like that's the best way to care for my family. And yeah. and I'm just, I don't feel like I'm fully well equipped to speak for all of those people because, you know, the job that I get to have does place probably more than I know anybody else, you know, on like, hey, be there for your family. You know, don't, you need to miss a meeting. Like I've never ha- missed a meeting, even if it's an important meeting where someone was like, what, you missed that meeting for your family? You know, they could have dealt with it when you got home, you know, so I'd, it's hard for me mm-hmm. to speak, you know, at, from culture at large because I don't feel all those same pressures yeah. uh, all the time uh, that I know some of my friends do of like, well, I know I have to be out of town at this meeting. And if I'm not out of town at this meeting, I lose my job. And so I don't, I don't have to have those conversations with my wife all the time yeah. or my kids, why I can't go to their events and all those things. And so I just feel in some ways a little bit ill-equipped that I would represent fully like what it is for most probably Mm -hmm. working class men in that. And, and I know that that's such a place of a privilege and a, and a thing that I'm very, very grateful for, Mm -hmm. uh, just in the culture that I get to do life in and, and, you know, the place that I get to call my job. Yeah. Well, did that answer your question, Jess? Yeah. Okay. That was, it's not, I just, I just think it's good to like, we can talk like overarching, but like, I just want to get mm-hmm. deeper into the weeds of like, yeah, how are we interpreting it? That's just one way, but like, what are your guys' perspectives? Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I, I mean, I, I think we're going to start wrapping this up, but a, a couple of the talking points, you know, that we had to jot it down here was just kind of this idea of freedom of speech speech versus offensive language and I, I I don't know I mean I I don't think anything in anything he said was downright offensive or you know I may I may not have fully agreed with everything he said but I don't know it's pretty it's pretty minor compared to what mm-hmm. you hear in a lot of other things avenues of people having freedom of speech so yeah and I think you see over and over in scripture as the, as the church is, you know, happening, coming up, you think of, I think of Paul inside of Acts and Barnabas inside of Acts and, and, um, as they're having conversations with people, they're speaking pretty boldly uh, Mm -hmm. about their faith and they're speaking boldly to the culture and what they believe. And they're not shying away. Like we're called not to like hide our, Hide, you know, you sang that song, like hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine like this little light of mine. And so mm-hmm. I think this is kind of probably a way that he is doing some of those things. And over and over people get ticked off at Paul and Barnabas, but 
the Lord continues to show us up. The spirit continues to show up as, as they talk and proclaim the kingdom. And when they proclaim the kingdom, and I don't know that his speech is fully proclaiming the kingdom, because I think there are a lot of unifying things. Like if I was given that charge to give that speech, I think I would have focused a lot more on ways that we can unify mm-hmm. uh, than ways to bring disunity. I probably wouldn't have just outlined out made bold blanketed statements about the president and, you know, Mm -hmm. some of the things that he did, I think politically were probably out of line and only going to speak to a certain people. And then at that point you just, you're not building a bridge anymore. And so for me, I'm like, I just want to be a bridge builder and not just take a bunch of pot shots at people where I'm going to automatically, you know, put myself into some camp where everybody can guess, you know, how I vote and about all these things. And he does talk about a lot of, you know, things that are hot button political issues, even inside of the Catholic church around, you know, birth control and IVF and a lot of things that, you know, I I think are very bold (laughs) statements uh, inside of a, a place like that without a, a lot of empathy. So when he kind of makes some of those statements and like takes a charge at some of these things, um, I, I think he's not speaking with, with a lot of empathy for victims, for people that have had to wrestle through, you know, some mm-hmm. of those decisions. And, um, and it, I think you can speak in boldness, but not be callous. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of those comments, you know, can come across very callous in the way that Mm -hmm. he, he talked about them and not, you know, loving uh, one another and not, um, encouraging, um, and not building up confidence in one another. And, and so, you know, Jesus, as he prayed, you know, he prays that we would be one, that we'd be in unity. And so it seems like maybe his goal was to create more division than it was to um, create more unity. And I'm just probably wired differently personally. I also think he used the opportunity to con to use it to contradict when, like when we first started the podcast, like reading or listening to his, the church of nice, I think Mm he Mm -hmm. used the speech to contradict and to kind of like play into the, yeah. We're not the Speak church of nice. And is, isn't there a, there's always a space for big C church has issues. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. there are issues that we need to challenge and we need to question and we need to protect and advocate for people. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, and so I don't feel like any of us are saying that there's a space to bring something up and there is a boldness to what he did at a commencement speech. Mm-hmm. I don't know. He used his, he used the opportunity. <laughs> certainly. Yeah. I think there's, and there, there's definitely people who feel like they have an unheard voice. And, and if they're, if he's speaking for them, mm-hmm. that's great. But I, yeah, I just wonder how real that is and how much of it's just a misconception because of how social media and news media and things represent these t- sorts of situations if someone were to just get out there and speak truth, but not like you said, not be callous. It's not as controversial. It doesn't sound as controversial. It doesn't feed the algorithm. It's not going to necessarily go viral. Yeah. It's not going to go viral. It's just going to be someone out there saying, you know, you could be speaking gospel truth and it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. This guy's not interesting. But if you're, if you're targeting other parties and specifically calling them out and telling them that they're wrong and here's why, you're going to cause controversy. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's part of me, I'm just like, ah, I don't know. I can't help but think, you know what you're doing here to a certain extent, you know, they, the school knew what, what they were doing. He knew what he was doing. And some of that's more intentional than people want to mm-hmm. give credit to. But that the, I found it in scripture cause I, you know, I don't want all the, the, haters in the YouTube to say, we didn't talk about the Bible at all. They so never wait this long let into me, the episode. Yeah, they already give up, but <laughs> no, it was, I was talking about Acts and Paul and P, Peter and John actually in, in Acts. And it talks about this in Acts four, uh, it says when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were ordinary unschooled men and they were astonished. Uh, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And so this is a story of, you know, Peter and John speaking 
you know, against the leaders, the religious leaders inside of this and with a lot of boldness proclaiming the truth of the gospel inside of this. And, and at the end of the day, I think the beauty of that is the people were astonished, not necessarily by all the great arguments that they had, Mm. but they were astonished and they took note that these guys had been with Jesus. And I think at the end of the day, especially if that's what you're going to represent, like my hope, you know, when I get an opportunity to do this is, you know, that as I wax eloquent about whatever I do and I use whatever words that I do that, man, people would take note that I've been with Jesus, that I've spent time in his word and have enough humility to, to be wrong, admit when I'm wrong and all those sorts of things. Yeah. So, all right. Well, now the internet has our reaction to Mr. Butker's speech. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. No matter where you are, we always appreciate that. If you have any questions or concerns, you can reach out to us on social media, on TikTok or Instagram at CCC OMA podcast. Send us an email to CCC Omaha, our podcast at CCC org, or you can reach out to us on voicemail on the old telephone uh, dial 402-885-9930. And for those of you who just missed that number or you're scrambling for a pencil and you didn't know you could rewind podcasts, go that number is 402-885-9930. And until next time, we'll talk to you then.